Good afternoon to you. 406 now, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. Coming up, Daniel Turner joins us at 430. We'll talk about American energy, international energy, and the role that it plays in so much of the chaos that we are seeing going on around us right now. And then Sharice Trump will be with us at 530 from Speech First. No relation, by the way, in case you were wondering. To talk about these college campuses, how radical they are. Students openly supporting acts of terrorism against Israel. What can we do about that? We'll talk to Sharice about that at 530. And we'll chat with you at 888-630-9625. 888-630-WMAL. Uh, you know, there is a mountain of evidence uh, before us now that shows all the ways in which Joe Biden was clearly working to trade favors while he was in positions of authority within the United States government in order to enrich his family. Endless evidence of that. And let's add another one to the pile. America First Legal has brand new information that they've uncovered by way of a lawsuit. They've been going after this information for years the Deputy Director of Investigations for America First Legal, John Zadrozny, joins us now with the update. John, good to have you with us, sir. Hey, Vince. Thanks for having me on. Um, tell me about these emails. You've you've come upon some number of, of emails. What have you learned? So here's the latest on this. So we've been involved in some litigation as a result of our multiple FOIA requests uh, uh, to get into what was happening in the uh, vice presidential office when Joe Biden was vice president uh, with the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA. And a lot of those requests basically were stiff armed by the administration, which was not unexpected. And so we've uh, we've since filed uh, lawsuits against NARA and other administration agencies to get at this information. And uh, in the course of our lawsuit, we have been able to get some documents thus far. But every now and then stuff happens at, at what's called a status conference, where the two parties are discussing uh, what the future is for document productions. Basically, Vince, the bottom line is you only really get anything at that point once a court's involved. When an administration refuses to give you documents, you file a lawsuit, you get in front of a judge, and the judge presides over the future rollout of documents. Well, what was determined by mutual agreement between the parties, between us and the government, under judicial supervision, was that there were – tens of thousands of additional documents, meaning basically emails between Office of the Vice President or OVP personnel and uh, Biden family business interests. And we're talking tens of thousands, in excess of 29,000 broken among the various interests. I can walk you through them, too. For emphasis, we don't have those documents yet. We just know the numbers. Yes. So, so just immediately, the thing that jumps out at me is this is yet again proof of Joe Biden lying about knowing about his, quote, son's business dealings. Uh, that's correct. And uh, so the, and, and in a world where he didn't know about this, uh, he was grossly negligent in the management of OVP while vice president. And it doesn't fit with anything else we know that he wouldn't have known. Obviously, we think he knew. Here's what we we know from what we've been able to agree upon. Uh, NARA has told us that it has 19,335 emails between OVP personnel and Rosemont Seneca, 4,243 emails between OVP personnel and Hunter Biden himself. 1,751 emails between OVP personnel and Jim Biden, the president's brother, and then another 3,738 emails between OVP personnel and uh, Jim Biden's group, the Lion Hall group. So all so, told, that's literally 29,000 emails between people in Biden's official capacity as vice president yes. and uh, Biden family business interests. What's interesting to me about the numbers you just read out uh, are that, is that th there was more communication – with the business organizations put together by the Biden family than there were with Biden family members directly. Yes, and that's very telling, too, especially because we've been told that um, there was no interaction. I mean, remember how the storyline has kept changing, Vince. First, it was uh, the president never talks to his son about business. Then he doesn't talk to him about certain businesses. Then he's not aware of what's going on exactly, but he's never been in business with him. And this is an example of the changing goalposts. Yes. There are more emails with family business interests than with Hunter Biden and Jim Biden themselves. And that's just amazing. It is I amazing. Mean, like, I could, the, you have me, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, the, one of the latest excuses they've used in that goalpost shifting that you're talking about is to the extent Joe Biden was talking to these business partners, it was only about things like the weather. I'm looking at 19,335 emails, according to your findings, with Rosemont Seneca. This is the 
uh, investment firm where Hunter Biden, Devin Archer, and John Kerry's stepson, Chris Hines, they put this together. Uh, they're apparently on 19,335 emails with Joe Biden's vice presidential office. My guess is that that is not 20,000 emails about the weather. No, I mean, they'll probably blame climate change, but I'm willing to bet it's not about the weather. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what's, what's really interesting here, too, is um, I was just trying to think, like, back in my day as a federal employee, I can probably count on two hands the number of times I emailed a family member something from my work account. Now, that's not necessarily typical of federal workers, but I'm just saying the sheer volume here begs some questions about exactly what was going on. Was this the full-time job of OVP staff to manage Hunter Biden's and the big so, guy's business interests? So what you're referring to is not just emails directly from Joe Biden to any of these people, although I presume it, it could include that, but these are the staff members of the vice president's office. So the, the Biden family must have felt like they were, uh, that, that the staff worked for the family. Uh, that's correct, Vince. And I think that's that's definitely, you know, the big guy's posture probably has been for a very long time. To be clear, these are just emails that the office of the vice president, the OBP, and someone in that office had with those entities or individuals. Now, it, you know, was for one of the, the pseudonyms that Joe Biden's email accounts were, were they involved in these yes. emails? We don't know. Who was sending the email? Who was receiving the email? Who was cc We don't know any of that. Well, we don't know what kind of attachments there are. We just know these emails exist. You know, I've got good friends uh, who I can tell you with assurance that over the over the years of our relationships, I have not sent 20,000 emails to them. I have not. I have <laughs> not been on 20,000 email exchanges with some of my closest friends. That's just true. So this suggests to me, uh, John Zadrozny, that it might be that the vice president's office was putting these business partners on some sort of routine dispatch. Uh, 20,000 emails is a lot. That's like a daily newsletter where you're sending a, a daily report on what's going on inside of the vice president's office. Yeah, that's a good point, Vince. I would suspect it's some mix of, you know, daily emails on certain topics, um, outreach on something that's on fire here and there, uh, transactional information and how to respond to it. Um, you know, and keep in mind, too, this dovetails with what we do know, because we have actually AFL has actually already received documents as a result of previous requests by NARA that showed basically OVP was already running as a full time PR firm on behalf of Hunter Biden partly in conjunction with his service for Burisma, but not exclusive, meaning that basically OVP was already working for the Biden family, whether they, they would admit it or not, that there was a full-time operation. So add to those handful of e relative handful of emails that we received to this massive volume of emails that we have not received. And I think there's a lot more there there, and hoping, hopefully we get to see them and share them with the public soon. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Where does this go next? Is it just, is it just the, the constant battle to find out what's underneath all of this? Uh, basically, yes. So it comes down to right now, too, some things we can't talk about because we are in front of a judge. And so um, a lot of this is based on mutual engagement with the government uh, the attorneys for NARA and the judge. I think the, the basic way, though, it'll go is that at some point the judge will start saying, OK, well, he or she, I, the judge will make a determination regarding whether or not the documents are relevant. They may ask us to make some concessions in terms of scope. That's usually how these status conferences go. And then we produce joint reports saying, What's going on and are we complying with court orders? And so it depends on how fast the judge wants to move. It depends on how fast or rather it depends on whether the judge thinks the government's making BS arguments about what should and shouldn't be turned over. Uh, as a result, just to flag this for you, you'll find this interesting. The numbers we came up with were a result of, of NARA basically saying, well, we want to find a way to narrow what we're going to turn over. And here's the total universe. <laughs> and the total universe is basically 30,000 documents, which leads to the question, begs the question, well, what could we possibly pull out of this that wouldn't be relevant? So that's stuff that will be discussed between the attorneys and the judge. Yes. Um, but it really just – there's a lot of there there, and we don't really know the answers yet. And But at least they admitted they exist. This is a far cry from the stiff arm we got from NARA and so, other agencies last summer where they said they don't exist. One of the confusing features of this entire story, though, is why are they using official accounts to communicate with Biden family businesses? That, that strikes me as bizarre, especially given that Joe Biden – was using pseudonyms uh, while he was vice president of the United States to include things like Robert Peters and J.R.B. Ware and all of this. Uh, you would think that if they're doing something underhanded, they would try not to subject it to public disclosure. Well, that's a good point, Vince. The only counter I can give you are two, is twofold. One is that uh, these are lefties, and so they live in a world where there is never going to be pushback for being a lefty, no matter what corruption gets uncovered. Even now, they're saying this is no big deal when we all know it is a big deal, and it could just be sloppiness on their part. But I think the one other dimension to it is there could be sort of a, 
sort of a proof of power element here. Like the, if you can show, like it's one thing to have a fake Gmail account for the vice president saying, no, I'm Joe Biden, even though that's not my name in the email, uh, and I'm in charge, and I'll do this and this for you. Right. It's so much better to be able to forward an office, an email from, you know, at ovp.eop.gov to someone saying, look, this is real. We can make this happen. Yeah, that, that demonstrates access for sure. There's no question about that. Um, well, I got to say, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, America First Legal for all of its great work and the fact that you just keep digging in on this. I, I think it's very worthwhile. Uh, I know people are frustrated constantly that it seems like we just get updates like this. It doesn't go anywhere. But the truth is you don't get the ammunition to, to bring it somewhere without great groups like yours. So John Zadrozny, thank you very much for digging in, sir. Thank you so much, Vince. That's uh, John Zadrozny. Again, with America First Legal, with I think, you know, it's just like it not a surprise. It's it's amazing that we've gotten this far in this saga where now you see headlines like, oh, yeah, the vice president's office had 20,000 emails exchanged with Hunter Biden's business. And you say, yeah, typical. Add it to the pile. Add it to the pile. How much more would you need for a prosecution? I mean, you got to be kidding me. You see those, you know, those shows where they do the yarn boards, where they like they tack things to a to a, a, a cork board and the, all the pictures and the documents and they connect it with yarn. Oh, you run out of yarn. You just sell out an entire craft store with the amount of yarn needed to put together all the pieces here. It's, this is a million things. It's a million things. And the press is still going along with this no evidence crap. Actually, they're not talking about it at all these days. No, they've, they've, they've moved on uh, a million times over. Uh, but man, to the extent that they ever have to, there's no evidence here. Oh, there's 20,000 emails with the vice president's office in Rosemont Seneca. Isn't that amazing? And we've got uh, we've got more headlines here for you. I'm gonna I'll share them with you in a moment. Uh, there's brand new information. I realize that there's so much chaos in the world right now with the terrorists attacking Israel, uh, and I promise you more updates coming up on that. But we do have more information about Joe Biden's corruption. It just keeps coming out, and now it's like the press continues to ignore it. They suffocate these headlines. Uh, and uh, and then plenty on the right are like, oh, another thing. When are we going to get rid of this guy? Trust me, I feel the same way. But you've got to know what's happening. I'm going to tell you in just a moment. We are now seeing reports. We have been seeing reports that Israel is preparing a major offensive into the Gaza Strip against Hamas. A major offensive. Not hard to see why, by the way. Just the horrors that were committed to the Israeli people. You would hope any country that has dignity would uh, would act with aggression against the murderers, against the terrorists here. Um, Israel has called up 300,000 reservists, 300,000. Just for perspective, you know that Israel is a population of about 9 million people. 300,000 is a huge chunk of their population. 9 million people. And another, another comparison for you, New York City is a city of about 8 million. So you got a population in Israel about the size, a little bit bigger than the size of New York City. And uh, they are preparing what they say could be a very major ground offensive against Hamas into the Gaza Strip. Uh, we're talking a very dicey situation, of course. You've got uh, all of these hostages, 130 of them at least, according to Hamas. That's what they're claiming, that they took from Israel into the Gaza Strip. And um, among them are Americans. We got confirmation today from the White House that that's the case. Now, the, the barbarism committed by Hamas is something that, I don't know, the American left, there's plenty of people on the American left who don't seem to care. Right? They're for it, I guess, uh, who are rooting all of this on, including on college campuses. And it's just super grotesque what's happening here in the United States. Uh, but there's also people like, this guy, he's a member, he's a spokesman for Hamas, and he was on Sky News this week, and he said that no civilians have died. No civilians. Now, you've seen the images. This is what this guy's saying. Are you saying we, that civilians have not died? Civilians, we didn't kill any civilians. Uh, uh, it depends what on about how the 260 how bodies? What about the 260 bodies at the music festival? Do you realize I, 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 how absurd that, I, that sounds? Now, within, within, within the operation, uh, I cannot uh, confirm uh, this Israeli propaganda because we have also news and videos showing that Israel and what Israel is today doing disgusting, inside disgusting Gaza. Disgusting propaganda from that guy. Um, here is, uh, there's a report this morning, and uh, I got to say, just to prepare you for the, the, the nature of this audio, 
Um, the revelation of what has happened to little babies in Israel is now being confirmed by American media. 24 News, a correspondent by the name of Nicole Suzedek, was on the ground there in Israel, and here's what she reported today. David, it's hard to even explain exactly just the mass casualties that happened right here. In fact, the Israeli military says they still don't have a clear number, but I'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses, these different communities, uh, babies, their heads cut off. That's what they said. Gunned down, families completely gunned down in their beds. You can see some of these soldiers right now comforting each other. Many of them reserves uh, who jumped into action, leaving their own families behind as well, not knowing the sheer horror that they were about to come to. They say they've never experienced anything like this. This is nothing that anyone could have even imagined when you're walking through here. Uh, you heard it there, babies beheaded by these animals, Hamas. Nora O'Donnell of CBS News has confirmed this detail. She posted a short while ago, CBS News has learned that Israel body recovery teams have discovered beheaded babies and children in kibbutzim in southern Israel. Um, so that really happened. And uh, it's no wonder that Israel is now mobilizing hundreds of thousands of reservists to go to war here against Hamas. Not a war they asked for, a war that uh, has come to them. As, these, as this terror attack has struck Israel. Uh, we'll keep bringing you the updates on this. Everything we're learning, it's a very live situation, including the U.S. engagement in this. Uh, Joe Biden today saying in, re in remarks for the first time in days coming out in public and saying we stand with Israel. Certainly many Americans do, but a little rich hearing it from him when he's done so much to advance the interests of Hamas and Iran. No mention of Iran today in his remarks. We're dealing with a lot here. We'll talk energy and its role in all of this next with Daniel Turner. Hang tight. Well, good afternoon to you. 4.35 now. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up, we're going to be joined by Sharice Trump at 5.30 from Speech First. And uh, boy, because college students using their free speech rights across the country to say the worst possible things. They really are supporting Hamas, the terrorists, condemning Israel, the victims. Places like NYU, Harvard, Columbia, disgusting scumbags making statements in support of terrorism. You see Black Lives Matter chapters are all signaling their support for Hamas too. Way to go, Mitt Romney. Marching with BLM, you know, just just totally gross. We'll, we'll get into the details ahead with Sharice Trump. Right now, I want to concentrate on, uh, well, first, also, you can call us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. I want to concentrate uh, for a moment on the energy factor to all of this. Because when you peel it all back, one of the things that stands out to me is how obvious the production of American energy is to bring about global stability and to bring about human flourishing and to bring, bring about what is our concern specifically, American flourishing. This seems obvious. I, am I wrong? Let's bring in Daniel Turner. He's the founder and executive director of Power of the Future, and he joins us on the phone. Hello, Daniel. Ben, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. I mean, for, first of all, I, all of this chaos that we're seeing, I, I, I do feel like that there is an answer built into just producing more American energy, no? Oh, absolutely. I feel like you watch what's happening now in the Middle East and also even the invasion in Ukraine last year, and these were all very predictable. I, I've sometimes, you know, I was, I was just telling your, your producer before we went online, I'm taking a victory lap for having predicted this, but I'm not proud of that. Like, I'm not happy that I, I in, in, in 2020, when Biden was declared the victor, said, well, here's what's going to be the result, right? When we punish energy, life is going to get very expensive. And unfortunately, many of the world's bad actors produce oil and gas, and they're going to get very rich. And when they have a lot of money, they declare war on their neighbors. Yes, this is how uh, Russia I've finances its this. war. This is how Russia finances yeah. its war in Ukraine. This is how Iran finances its terrorism against Israel. 
Uh, and it just the 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 cycle is is an obvious one. And yeah. the Biden administration is selling us down the river. Their their plan is, well, we need to do green energy. We need to handicap our own energy production. And that empowers the world's worst people, doesn't it, Daniel? It does. It, it, it's, um, it's very obvious and it's very preventable. The good news is it's also reversible. It's not going to happen immediately, but, but it is reversible. Um, and, and I kind of look at the, the, the militant anti-oil and gas uh, movements, the militant anti-fossil fuel movements, led, of course, by people like John Kerry. Um, to a certain extent, it, it's the same as the, 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 the anti-Second Amendment people when they say, we're just going to take away your guns. And then you think, well, that means only the bad guys are going to have guns. When you say we're going to take away America's oil, well, sadly, only the bad guys are going to have oil. And, and I do put OPEC nations. I put Russia in the bad guy category. You know, I wish – and it's a question I'll ask our Lord and Creator when I – if I'm lucky enough to get to heaven, why did you put oil uh, in some of the places of the world that seem to have bad governments? But I, I, I can't answer that. You know, I don't know why America is blessed, Canada is blessed, but then the rest of the world that has a lot of oil tend to be – very bad countries. But that's just the way it is. And you also can't have this naivete to say, well, we're just going to get rid of oil because the world runs on oil, right? You were, yeah. you were talking about those Harvard and Columbia students. You know, they, if Candace Owen goes on campus, they, they fall over and, and, and double over in pain. Um, you know, they need puppies to get through midterms. So they're out here with all their bravado celebrating Hamas but they can't survive without soy lattes. They can't survive without air conditioning and, and, and temperature controls. So, so they're, they're so cushy. Well, they have such cushy lives yeah. because of oil and gas, because of fossil fuels. It's, it's amazing to how this is not obvious to more people. Yeah, and it would be one thing if these guys were a bunch of freaks like Westboro Baptist Church that didn't really have any influence or anything. It just like, you know, just don't cover them, make them go away. But these are – this is the ruling class. This is the ruling class yep. in training. They're at Harvard. They're preparing to go on to these powerful jobs, and they're going to wield influence, uh, and they are complete morons. So that, I'm going to – They are. We're going we're gonna to get into some more details on that. But uh, on American energy, let me, let me play something for you. This is uh, – you probably saw this. Admiral Kirby, John Kirby, was on with Martha McCallum this week on Fox, and he yeah. was asked about the existential threat of climate change. Now, remember – this is within the context of a terror attack on Israel. Listen to this exchange. I want to play this soundbite for you that is just last month in Vietnam and ask you if this still holds for the president. Watch. The only existential threat humanity faces, even more frightening than a, than a nuclear war, is global warming going above 1.5 degrees in the next 20, 10 years. Given all the nuclear players in these two areas where we are now engaged, John, does the president stand by that comment? Absolutely, he does. Here's a little bit more from John Kirby about how he answered that. Climate change is an existential threat. It could, you know, it actually threatens and is capable of wiping out all human life on Earth uh, over time. I mean, that's I don't know how more existential you can get to that, but that doesn't mean that we walk away from our obligations, our national security interests. Um, this is contemptible, in my view. Uh, yeah. Daniel Turner, uh, he, they're, they're saying that we need to keep on destroying American energy production uh, and thus enabling. I mean, come on. Kirby knows the answer to this. Oh, we're enabling uh, Iran, which is funding Hamas, which is beheading children now, beheading babies yeah. in, in Israel. This is an insult. The, the, the joys about saying climate change is an existential threat is that the solutions – empower government and if you love government if you love big government if you are a statist like joe biden is a statist then climate change is the perfect uh, uh, threat because it is malleable it is adaptable it's never solvable right and so you just grow your power you squash a dissent you label everyone a misinformer the problem with what happened over this weekend as we saw uh, just a couple hours ago when joe biden gave his his remarks the problem with the attacks on israel is that the enemy is really identifiable and really – it's very concrete and decisive, but now you have to call them out. And Joe Biden doesn't want to call out Iran. He doesn't want to say, I just gave those guys $6 billion. He doesn't want to say, I've been spending three years to try to get them a nuclear power. Yes. So he pivots back to climate change because it is whatever you want it to be so long as it gives you, the government, more and more power over a free people. Um, you know – 
the, the Iran in particular, they're making all this money on oil exports. That's their that's the way they make their money. They've got this oil three times more since Trump took since Trump uh, uh, administration. They are making three times more on oil because of the uh, the sanctions that this administration took off. Um, right before Joe Biden was inaugurated, they were selling around 900,000 barrels of oil a day. Now they're selling 3.3 million. With oil around $80 a barrel right now, that is a lot of money in the hand of the Iranians, and they are not building schools for girls. Wait, they export 3.3 million barrels of oil per day? How much does the United that, States export? Um, well, well, per, let me say produce. We produce around 12 and a half to 13 million barrels and Iran is well over 3 at this point. Well over 3. And that's because we that's because we've taken away their sanctions. Right? Yes. They 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 were not producing oil because they weren't allowed to. So now the 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 uh, effete and weak west says, "Well, we're not buying their oil, but we're allowing our so, allies to buy it. We're allowing India to buy their oil, Brazil, South Korea. How about we tell those countries you can't buy Iranian oil because when you buy it they spend that money on terrorism. Uh, is is it, I thought um, China. I don't know if China is. Is China the number one purchaser of Iranian oil? They are a massive buyer. Absolutely, they they are, and and a lot of other countries that that still have diplomatic ties with Iran also buy their oil. But yeah, China is far and away. But China is also the largest buyer of Russian oil and gas. Yes. So when the West. When the West had their Russian sanctions, China said, great, we'll just buy it exclusively. Now we don't have to compete. So, Daniel Turner, where do we buy our solar panels and our windmills from? (laughs) Oh, of course we buy it all from communist China. We're making them rich. We're making Iran rich. We're making Russia rich. Again, this goes back to my opening line. This was all preventable, but all foreseeable, very, very predictable. And I'm not happy about that. I don't want – if Joe Biden succeeded and the world was a better place after two and a half, three years of him in office, I'd be happy because I want the world to be a better place. I yes. don't want Americans – I want Americans to have a better life. Yes. But where in the world is things – where in America is life better? Where in the world is, are things better with the Biden administration, with this green agenda? So so we, we look at world peace. We look at the, the problems we've created – it is like the 70s again, the tensions in the Middle East. And you can scream all you want, no blood for oil, and it's a nice bumper sticker. But the world runs on oil. And if you went to France over the summer, sweetheart, it was oil, right? And if you're Instagramming your trip to the Poconos, it's oil. The world runs on oil. Freedom runs on oil. So you can shout no blood for oil, but now the adults have to be in charge well, and say sure. when only the bad guys have guns, the bad guys are going to use those guns on us, and that's what we're doing with this policy. Well, also, as, I, as you and I are pointing out, green energy runs on oil. The whole thing is a, is a <laughs> gigantic scam. And and it's amazing that China is at the center of all of this and received no conversation. I, uh, today, Biden didn't mention Iran at all. He didn't mention no. them at all in his remarks. But by extension, he also didn't mention China because Iran is being funded by China – and then turning around and dumping that money into terrorism, acts of terrorism all across the Middle East, but in particular against Israel. And uh, and nothing is said about any of this. And meanwhile, we are buying we, we are the the weapons are of our own suicide are being purchased from China. The windmills, the yeah. the solar panels, that's all coming from China. And if if I were the Chinese Communist Party, I'm not sure I could script all of this better. I get America to be at war with itself. I sow division within that country. I get the the American people to literally buy the fake green energy crap from us, and then I get mm-hmm. all of the world's worst people. Uh, I fund them, and they continue to create uh, a lot more weakness in America. This is, and and the answer to this is what, uh, Daniel? How do we get out of this? The, the answer to this is is obviously you have to elect people who who will stop buying on buying into the green agenda. The green agenda is communism. With, with, with a green paint on it. It is the same lousy agenda that has been destructive for, for decades now. Um, it, it takes away private property. It punishes individual liberty. It collectivizes everything and puts it in the hand of the government for this phony threat. Ask people in Israel right now if climate change is the greatest existential threat they, fake, they face. And you know what's even more funny? In just a couple of weeks, COP28 in Dubai, John Kerry, 40,000 people, they're all going to attend this two-week summit in, uh, to talk about climate change, the existential threat. 
and, and we're supposed and, to pretend that this is a real threat when we all know it's just one gigantic lie. And so here's the thing I want people to remember as that, that summit gets together and they talk about – they fly in on their private jets to talk about how everyone needs to turn over their power to the, the globalists. Uh, they're funding Hamas. This yes. is a conference to fund Hamas. That's what that is. You're funding the petro dictators around the planet. You're funding the war on Ukraine. You're funding the war on Israel. You're funding the war on Americans. You're funding the hostage taking of Americans. You're funding the beheading of children. You're funding the destruction of societies. Daniel Turner, it's enough. It's enough. And I, I this is why I like talking to you because it just reminds me, like, it's all about getting some security for yourself. It's good for the economy. It's good for your national security. It's good for the world. It is. It is. And that's why the global movement, the global climate movement, the green movement, the climate change is an existential threat movement. It is the luxury of a very rich suburban uh, uh, community, right? It's, it's bored housewives. It's a feet beta men. Because when you look at the world, when you look at the threats that we face internationally, when you look at peace, when you look at the national economy, you realize that you don't have time to play these nonsense games of we have to ban plastic straws, right? When you look at the beheading of 40 babies in an Israeli daycare center, you don't have time to play. What about the sea turtles? Exactly. What about, what about, what about sea levels? You realize it is one gigantic and very, very evil system that has and it's to a be scam. defeated, just it's like scam. Hamas. And it's a total scam. You're not going to change the weather. It's, the whole thing is so stupid. It, it's, it's, if, if that was real, if it was real, John Kerry would not be flying private. We would not be buying windmills and uh, solar panels from China. We'd be putting up nuclear power plants all over the place. It's not real. They're, they're well, lying to you, and their actions demonstrate it with every passing day. And normally I like to come on the show with a couple of funny jokes and, and laugh, but I can't today. I, I mean, I, there's, nothing, there's nothing funny about what's happening anymore. And energy policy should be boring. It should be perfunctory. We should have bipartisan agreement on energy. But this is what happens when the left takes root of anything, whether it's the education system, whether it's the energy system. They destroy it from within. They create division. They create misery. They create chaos. And then we're left with the pieces. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I normally have a couple of funny lines, but I'm out of them today, Vince, because you can't look at what's happening in the world and look at the, the Biden energy policy and be anything but depressed. Well, you're, you're just reminding us that rational thought still does exist out there. Daniel Turner, thank you very much. Good to talk to you as always, sir. All right, your calls, as always, pouring in. We appreciate those. Let me go to Dave in Alexandria, line two. Dave, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Gallinay Show. Hello, Vince. How are you? Um, don't take this the wrong way. And, and I agree wholeheartedly that Iran really should be bombed off, off the map. But with the actions of the Obama administration sending the overnight billions to Iran with um, – with uh, the, shut, the the termination of Keystone II pipeline just enriching Russia, with the $6 billion recently paid by O. Biden to Iran, mm -hmm. while Iran may be the biggest funder of terrorism, but you almost have to say the United States is truly the biggest funder of terrorism by those three actions, there, you know, without the, the Keystone being shut off, there's no invasion of Ukraine, or there, there's no prolonged invasion. All of these things come from yeah. billions sent to um, a, a disgusting um, regime. Yep, absolutely. And, 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 and by lifting terms. the sanctions on uh, those exports from Iran, uh, what we've done is allowed China to fund them to, to massive amounts. So I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't take that the wrong way at all, Dave. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that Joe Biden, uh, more so than Joe, Obama and Biden, really, the two presidents in American history have done more than anybody to enable the growth of the Iranian terror regime, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. It's, uh, it's, it's grotesque, which is why I watch Biden today saying, well, we stand with Israel. That's, it's totally insane. Totally insane. For him to stand. And of course we do as a country, and I, I don't know a person who doesn't empathize with, sympathize with, care for, stand with Israel today. Uh, but the left, they've got a lot of those who are not standing with Israel. It's all over the place. We'll get into that coming up.
Sharice Trump will join us here in the next hour as all of these far left campuses, which are preparing our next ruling class, are churning out people who support terrorism and they're proud of it. The details on that ahead on the Vince Colonnais Show.